Coming up, has the world entered a new nuclear era? When it comes to who gets the bomb in the future, I can imagine a very wide range of possibilities, except one, disarmament. Yale professor Paul Bracken describes a second nuclear age marked by nationalism and fear. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. The topic for our discussion is nuclear weapons and the new environment in which they exist. The subject is particularly timely given the uncertainty of the multipolar nuclear world we live in. Our speaker is Paul Bracken, a leading national security strategist who is the author of an important new book entitled The Second Nuclear Age, Strategy, Danger, and the New Power Politic. Okay, as we speak, uh, North Korea is enriching uranium because they're building uranium-based atom bombs. Uh, they used to use plutonium. Uh, at the same time, Iran's centrifuges are flipping around there, as we all know. And how many thousands, I can't keep track of because every newspaper story I read has a different number. Uh, and at the same time, U.S. deputy secretaries of state are flying to Moscow to negotiate new details of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty about how to count things like bombs that are not deployed in missile silos. And I want to mention that I'm coming here not to talk about any of those things. But what I want to do is to take a step back and ask a different question. What do the three examples I just gave, and I could add 25 more easily, what do they mean? What's going on in the world? And the answer that I come up with and I'd like to offer uh, to you this morning is the one offered in my book, The Second Nuclear Age. And it is quite simply that, that the world has entered a second nuclear age. The first nuclear age was the Cold War. It had very well-defined timelines, some controversy about them. But if you look at it as the part of the Cold War, uh, Sometime in the late 40s, it started, and it ended in 1991 at the outside with the demise of the Soviet Union. There was a nuclear arms race. There was a big political contest in it, and that's what I call the first nuclear age. The second nuclear age is just that. It's, uh, I asked myself, what would you call what came after the first nuclear age? And I came up with this insight of calling it the second nuclear age. <laughs> As you can see, this provides a probably a great uh, future for me with uh, sort of <laughs> last seat comes home again, you know. <laughs> but I'd like to define the second nuclear age as the spread of atomic weapons for reasons that have nothing to do with the Cold War. In the book, there's actually a coy element in the definition because I'm arguing that the second nuclear age began a long time ago. It didn't begin, say, in the 1990s or the 2000s. In fact, if you look back at the history of the Cold War, uh, on one of my early visits to China, I actually tracked down one of the generals who put the Chinese nuclear forces on alert to be fired at the Soviet Union in 1969. So the idea that the first nuclear age was this monolithic communist bloc against the United States didn't make any sense, even by 1969. If we do step back from these details, what do we see? Okay, I think we see the emergence of a system of interacting parts with interconnections that are at least as complex as the Cold War, and in many ways more so. So my argument is that a new system of relations among countries has developed for those who have the bomb. I divide the countries who have nuclear weapons into, to, for simplification, into two classes. One, major powers, and two, secondary powers. And there's an arbitrary definition, but it's basically a $2 trillion GDP. So North Korea is a secondary power, in my judgment, giving it a lot, not to call it a tertiary or, or, or even less. But there's still major nuclear powers, and this would be the United States, Russia, France, Britain, China and India, all of which have the bomb. And my contention is that this second nuclear age has arisen out of natural causes. It's the fear, greed, and nationalism that has defined international relations for at least the past 1,000 years is now, is con not surprisingly, continued after the end of the Cold War. 
that in a world where greed and fear, nationalism are predominant forces, it should not be in any way, shape, or form surprising that countries, many of them, not all of them, would want to get the bomb. I would, to make this a little bit more specific, I would just offer you the case of India, a big, increasingly rich country, did not sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but got nuclear weapons in 1998 or 1974, however you define it. And the interesting thing about India today is that it is virtually an accepted nuclear power. When was the last time anybody in this room heard a call for India to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as a non-nuclear weapons state? So in my view, what's happening is that we are now moving into a nuclear Multi, it's a multipolar world. You hear that all the time. I think what people leave out of the equation is that it's also a nuclear multipolar world. Increasingly, to be seen as a major power, it helps if you have nuclear weapons. There's, of course, exceptions to this, Japan, Brazil. But India's joining the club, I think, is extremely significant. Uh, I'm not here to predict widespread proliferation or, uh, or, or minor proliferation. The way I'd put it is as follows. That when it comes to who gets the bomb in the future, I can imagine a very wide range of possibilities, except one, disarmament. When I look at these major powers for a country like China or Russia, the United States, or India to give up nuclear weapons, would significantly demote them in the status of major powers. More, I think the one particular major power, the United States, has much more to lose from this trend than any other. And we have been de-emphasizing nuclear weapons, certainly since the end of the Cold War. I think any reading of Cold War history would say that this started a lot earlier than that. Because the United States has the most splendid, effective conventional forces in the world. And we have a national global interest, a self-interest, in advancing this cause of nuclear non-proliferation. But if you take my argument that it's a multipolar nuclear system, my point is really can be said quite simply. Other countries don't see it that way. China, Russia, Pakistan, North Korea, certainly Iran, do not want to see a world made safe for American strong-armed conventional warfare tactics. It is in their interest to do something else, and many of them, all of those, are getting nuclear weapons. Okay, so we could look at the big major powers and how they are interacting, and they are, they are not putting nuclear weapons in the background. It, I would, in fact, I would, the way I would put it is that they, there's nine nuclear powers in the world today, nine countries we know of that have nuclear weapons. And if our, unless our intelligence is really bad, I don't think there's a tenth, at least yet. But it is possible, but there's nine. And eight of them are modernizing their nuclear forces for the 21st century. The one that, uh, that is not doing that, of course, is the United States. I'm not arguing that we should do that. I'm pointing out the, the enormous significance of the US pushing these anti-nuclear policies, which I fully support. What I don't support is the conclusion, though, that they're working. But the other major feature of this second nuclear age is the much more dangerous one, in my view, and that is the spread of nuclear weapons to the secondary powers. And here, to be quite specific, I'm talking about Israel, Pakistan, North Korea so far, and with Iran knocking on the door. The view that the nuclear proliferation regime could have prevented the, the, this uh, we could go into reasons why it did or didn't. But I think the power of natural causes and the attempt of imagined regimes to reverse really fundamental trends at the nation state level and at the global level to substitute for security in a world where countries still do not trust each other was doomed to failure. I, don't, I think it, it, we could argue that maybe it bought 10 or 20 years but the notion that what's happening now is that there's a weakening of the global non-proliferation regime, and that's the cause of the problems, is one that I would not support. The global non-proliferation regime is weakening, but much more fundamental forces are driving countries to get these weapons. Back to my contention 
that these weapons are spreading to uh, the Israel's, Pakistan's, and North Korea's. I think a better way to think about this is that the breakdown in the monopoly over nuclear weapons that major powers held until really fairly recently has broken down. And that the big risks in the future are very much in the regions. I would point out to you a very interesting uh, insight that I have here, I think, and that is that the uh, second nuclear age is in many respects the mirror image of the first nuclear age. In the, in the Cold War, the path to nuclear war always led at some point through Moscow and Washington because that's where the triggers were. At no time in the regional wars in Vietnam, in the counterinsurgencies in Africa, in the paramilitary fights in Latin America, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, did any of the regional powers control a trigger. And the recent revelations of the disputes between Fidel Castro in 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis with his Soviet counterpart on the island show that the big argument was that Castro wanted control of these nuclear weapons. And if you read the transcripts, it makes crystal clear what I was saying, that there was no way on God's green earth that the Soviet Union was going to allow that to happen because it was much too dangerous. Now we have inverted that in the second nuclear age that the triggers to nuclear war are in Tel Aviv, Islamabad, Pyongyang, and in the future, possibly Tehran, and possibly in other places too. Because you can start a nuclear war even if you don't have nuclear weapons. Because one of the other big differences with the second nuclear age compared to the Cold War, there's many differences. I don't think they're so enormous that it's like looking at an impressionist painting from 10 inches away and you don't see the pattern. But just consider this, the role of terrorism in the world today. Now, many speakers have probably come in here and said that the threat of terrorists getting their hands on nuclear weapons is a really bad thing. We all sort of understand that, but we don't understand the larger significance of terrorism, which is that it can catalyze a crisis situation. Ask yourself, what would have happened at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis with 86 B-52s armed with 11 or 12 hydrogen bombs each flying lazy eights outside of Soviet airspace? If at that point terrorists had hijacked, I guess it would be a Boeing 707 commercial airline and crashed it into the Pentagon and the Empire State Building. I don't know what would have happened, but it would have pushed the United States over the brink. More, if you look at not all, but major books about the uh, 911 attacks, Larry Friedman, University of London, his argument is that it was a conscious attempt to start a catalytic war to get the United, it was, this was not a war between Al Qaeda and the United States, it was Al Qaeda's attempt to get the United States to put large ground forces into Saudi Arabia and Iraq, and in that they succeeded. So my point is really quite simple, a terrorist with M16 rifles, airplanes, and a few bombs, not nuclear weapons, if they strike at the right time, as Pakistan and India are on de defense condition too, can trip this crisis over into a nuclear exchange. That's one, that never existed. Was there terrorism in the Cold War? Yes. Was it designed to provoke a larger war between the superpowers? There's not a single case of that. Another huge difference between the second nuclear age and the first is the role of emotion and hysteria. There's people in here, when I look around, I dare say, remember the Cuban Missile Crisis rather well. And in those instances, you would not find a million people at Times Square or deployed in the Washington Wall screaming for the blood of the Russians. That we must wipe out these inferior people because they don't have a right to exist. At no time where, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis or any other Cold War nuclear crisis did you find mobs like that in Red Square in the Kremlin. Sometimes there were mobs, but they never appeared when we were in a crisis between the two superpowers. Why? Because the leaders of the two sides knew they could be backed into a corner they might not get out of. 
The Cold War was run not on nationalism and hysteria. It was very distant from the street. Nobody was screaming for the other side's blood. We had clinical images, some of you may recall, of Secretary of Defense McNamara with big charts showing concave marginal return functions as a function of the <coughs> megatonnage we would land on the Soviet Union. And he was making almost like systems analysis arguments about how many megatons we needed. We treated the Cold War with a kind of clinical rationality which was detached from emotion, hysteria, and hatred. And in a nuclear crisis between India and Pakistan, Israel and Iran, North Korea and South Korea, or dare I say even China and Japan or the United States, my only point is simple, hysteria, nationalism, is going to be much larger. In fact, the Cold War, we, you know, it did have an ideology. Freedom and liberty versus atheistic, godless communism. To simplify a little bit. Uh, I went to Catholic school, and that was the aspects that were emphasized to me. <laughs> that they were atheists who didn't believe in God. <clears throat> the ideology, and we sort of think there isn't any ideology for a second nuclear age, but there is. And it's called nationalism. A force in the world, the U.S., and particularly the U.S. academic community, so consistently underestimates its power. If you were to go to a college campus today and look at courses on nationalism, they would have titles like Nationalism and the Politics of Genocide. It's looked at in entirely in a negative way, and it may be negative, but it doesn't look negative if you're in Russia, Pakistan, India or Israel. It's a driving force that we ignore and dislike at our peril. Okay, let me conclude uh, just by giving you a little example of how the United States has thought about these things in recent years, has thought about the second nuclear age. In 2007, the Air Force moved six hydrogen bombs from Mino Air Force Base in North Dakota. They flew them down to Barksdale in Louisiana in a, quote, routine move. They forgot to take the warheads off the bombs. They were flying live hydrogen bombs, okay? If you look at it, and it was uh, the Secretary of the Air Force and Chief of Staff of the Air Force were fired by Secretary of Defense Gates over this, and he appointed a commission which said, how can this happen? And the commission was headed by former Secretary of Defense, Jim Schlesinger, a man who knows his way around the defense establishment. And he came in and he said, yep, we did an investigation and they violated procedures. But he found a lot more. He said, attention to nuclear weapons in the Pentagon has disappeared since the end of the Cold War. Middle management wasn't paying any attention to it. Senior management at the secretariat level was not paying any attention to it. Therefore, it wasn't surprising to him that people in the field got the message that the people in the middle and at the top didn't think these things were important. The view that the United States nuclear establishment is this old cold warriors fighting arms control treaties is preposterous. The people who used to do that have long since died off or gone into retirement. Nobody is thinking about nuclear weapons and that's why that accident occurred. We have let the discussion of these issues fall to a dangerously low level, in my judgment, captured almost entirely by questions of nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament. But mention the word nuclear today in Washington or in a college campus, and if the next word isn't nonproliferation or disarmament, the conversation ends. The notion that North Korea and Israel and Russia and China have these weapons, and they're damn glad they do, just like the United States was in the Cold War, gets scant consideration, and I consider that dangerous. Uh, you've mentioned various reasons for having a nuclear weapon, nationalism, and then you've talked about hysteria, but you've talked around an issue, and that is Israel, North Korea, they're not gonna likely to use the bomb, except for a reason. But an Islamic Jihad will use the bomb if, in fact, they feel that that advances the cause. There's nothing wrong with dying in the cause of Islam, according to what's happening now. 
There is the problem, Pakistan or some other countries, even Iran. So why don't you talk about that one? Okay, I, first of all, I would uh, respectfully disagree that these countries are not using nuclear weapons. North Korea uses nuclear weapons every single day. And my tax dollars and yours are going to support the inept economy uh, and the lack of energy and the lack of political legitimacy there. It's a disastrous situation which the Western world is supporting. And I think we have to expand our notion of what it means to use a nuclear weapon. And that is a lesson we learned in the first nuclear age, too. Where the most important single lesson of the Cold War was you don't have to fire a nuclear weapon to use it. And North Korea is using nuclear weapons to that day. This doesn't obviate your concerns about the Islamic Jihad terrorists who think that they will, good things will happen if they use nuclear weapons. Um, and let me just sort of lay, lay it out on the table. There's no good answers here. It's, uh, I mean, it's better to prevent a second nuclear age than to go through and live it. Nobody's going to disagree with that. But we haven't prevented it. But we haven't faced up to the questions of what it means if we go into this nuclear age. Number one, what do you do if Iran actually uses nuclear weapons to terrorize Israel, to go on alert, to force Israel to go into a civil defense posture? And this could all happen, and nobody fires a single shot. You look at war games of this, you conclude deterrence worked. People said it would work, and it worked. But it didn't work, because Israel will find this and it will be an intolerable, intolerable situation. So what do we do? How do we configure our forces if we're forced to go to war of this? And when I say our forces, I mean conventional and nuclear forces. I don't think people are aware how atrophied our nuclear forces are. I mean, we, people look at the numbers that we have, you know, 10 times or 100 times as many as anybody else. Ask yourself, when was the last time we test launched a missile out from a real silo? Anybody know what the answer is? We tested two of them in 1967, and they both failed. Can you uh, comment a little bit about how the thinking of counterparts of the U.S. Uh, policy circles in, in Europe, or Russia, Japan, is on the questions you've described? Yes, it's a good question. It's what's the thinking in other counterparts, and what you're seeing now is innovation innovation for a nuclear environment. All right. Exactly. So it's, to me, it's like going back to the late 40s and early 50s, where there was tremendous attempt to find innovative uses for the bomb, which means more than hurling hydrogen bombs back and forth, which has its disadvantages. And in doctrines of deterrence and containment were in, invented only after we had the bomb. The view that these things came from on high and then we followed them. Let me, let me just give a couple of examples. Israel is shifting a good part of its nuclear deterrent to sea in German diesel submarines bought from Germany, full consent of the German government, undoubtedly the full consent of the United States government. And Israel in the future will have a secure deterrent that can't be taken out by a nuclear Iran. So you can see, even though Iran doesn't have the bomb today, she's already started dynamics in the region. Let's turn to Iran. She has mobile missiles which can reach well into Europe, and she also has fixed silo-housed missiles. Why? All right, we look at this, we just, you look at the details. We, have, we don't have a generation of people that looks at the structures anymore because they've retired or died. The reason for the fixed silo-housed missiles is so that, in my judgment, Iran could immediately go into a launch-on warning posture. This in itself would have immense political consequences, negative for Israel. More, she has to disperse her mobile missiles, and they're very awkward when they drive around, and you can find them, they go at like eight miles an hour, and they're vulnerable. So you want to cover this missile dispersal. So launch on warning, innovation number one, using silo house missiles to cover the mobile alert missiles. China is doing the same thing, building a much more agile force. My book is the only one that sort of pulled these templates together to look at the high levels of innovation. I'm not arguing that this innovation all makes sense. Some of it isn't crazy. I'm simply saying it's going on just as it, just as it did in the early Cold War. Can you make a case that Tehran wants the nuclear weapon 
in order to establish some sort of parity in that region against Israel, which can not only has major conventional forces, but also the nuke. Right. I think if you gamed it out, virtually any randomly selected American team and put them in Iran's spot, they would make the decision to get the bomb. I mean, I've done that on several occasions. It's perfectly rational. It isn't the breakdown of the non-proliferation regime unless you hold the invasion and occupation of Iraq in 2003 as part of that regime. Obviously, we can't handle the problems in those ways. Um, I would say something else. A lot of people say, but you, Professor Bracken, you really can't be sure that Iran has intentions of getting the bomb. And I would say that's certainly true. I don't have any inside pipeline into what's going on there. But boy, have countries gone to war with a lot more flimsy information than what we have there. Just take a look. And we don't have to go very far back. And you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> March 2003. But it isn't the only example. Our whole war in Vietnam was based on theories and speculation that didn't have hard evidence that Vietnam was going to be the cat's paw of communism. It didn't stop us from putting 550,000 troops there. So the standards, I would like to be higher. His history suggests that they're not. Thank you. You've been a great audience this morning. Thank you very much. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.